I'm what man now? I'm not academician. Uh, you all are academician. Practically, we learn something from teacher. Now I'm delivering something to teachers. It is that academics and all. But anyway, <coughs> as the man is rightly said, I have visualized the need of technology, digitalization, before a couple of decades. And that is what is required to be teach to new students. Basically, I was a science student, but because of my family, I have to join judicial, uh, sorry, this legal profession, legal fraternity. I have to practice as an advocate for a couple of years. There, I find out that what is going on in court, courts, is pathetic. No, nothing, I, I, I have no words to explain what is worse, because everything was worse. File keeping, date management, court management. So I develop a subject, court management, case management, a different management within a court. Time management, date management. Then I realized that to do all such things and the uh, maximum labor or time was consumed is in searching the old judgments, <coughs> citations, referring it repeatedly. And therefore, when nobody was aware about it, in 88 I have developed a software. I have engaged six data entry operators to enter the data of old judgments in a software and to use it in my day-to-day -day function. So, learning a law, reading a section is one thing, but how to apply it is a, altogether a different thing. I give you one small example of a law of limitation. Now, uh, scenario has changed before couple of decades or before for couple of decades uh, law of limitation was liberally taken limitation would immediately be condoned now it is not so so then in that case if you want to condone the delay you need as a law student you must learn so you as a teacher you must teach to your student that how to apply the law of limitation there must be sufficient ground and that sufficient ground must be properly pleaded properly proved Till date, a, a sentence in a pleading that I have reason not to appear in time or I, I, I have some difficulty in doing something in time was enough as a sufficient reason. Now it is not so. So time has changed. And for that purpose, I will recollect or I will uh, uh, give you an example of a story of a Panchandra. We have to teach lost, particularly law students, that they should be beam and Arjun at the same time. Do you know what is the difference between Bhim and Arjun? <coughs> have you read the story of Panchatra? Probably none of you because this new generation did not have it. When there was an exam, their Guru Dronacharya has asked the Bhim that what you can see? He, he said that I see the bird, I leaf, tree, you are standing near me, my brother Arjun, so many things. Then Guru said, okay, you can take proper uh, step. Then call her to ask him that what you can see. He say, I see only eye of the bird. Then go okay, hit it. But as a law student, a lawyer has to do both the things at a time. In a case, he should be like a bill, while in a courtroom, he should be like a Arjun. He should take care of the bench only, what bench requires, what judge requires, what court needs from him. And to prepare the case, he must be like a beam. He, he has to take care of entire thing, all the things, every details, each and every small facts of the case. So, so far as uh, new technology is concerned, now AI will be more material in future. In fact, in my report to the courts, as uh, I have done it, uh, this uh, model court in 2006, which is now some of you may be aware, Gujarat High Court and some other high courts. In Gujarat, even district courts have started and in Nagar, even Supreme Court will start online live streaming on YouTube. That, that concept was demonstrated by me to the courts in 2006. At the same time, I at the same time I have given in writing to use artificial intelligence, though it was not that much readily available during those days. But when you have a ready data of certain things, you can feed that data in computer and then you can give your details and 
computer will immediately give you answer that in, in the given details the answer would be this. It is it is the only basic concept of inter, uh, AI, artificial intelligence. So now you have to teach the students how to use it. And the last point is to make a best search. Either name Manupatra is in material or from any database. You have to teach the students how to make the best search in minimum time and with best result. This is what I, I have done since decades and therefore I, I reach up to this uh, stage. I have, as Vidya said, I have computerized the entire uh, Indian judiciary and uh, therefore probably I was called. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all of you. If you have any question, I will. I think very rightly uh, Sir conveyed that there has to be a correlation between law learned and law applied and how to become him and Arjun at the same time. Taking it from that, I request Shashikala ma'am to share her experience. Exactly matching all those courses, 21 plus 4, 
plus quality of other best practices from ANUJS and others, a bunch of electives to be offered. And these electives, fortunately for us, 2008 rules came which gave opportunity for honors course, specialization. And based on the interest of the student, opportunity from the family of lawyers or experts and the uh, expertise of the student. That means the best practice that we brought in student care was mentoring that student program. First we're doing a psychometric analysis, career choice and mentoring. So for us, quality and best practice at that time meant uh, a transformative experience for the student. Student comes in as somebody, develops all those attributes and becomes a somebody. So defining quality not just in the piecemeal criteria of NAMP by going by the bucket list of six criteria, but going by that product and graduate attribute. So when once we were clear about what my graduate should project, we had about 13 traits which we had identified. So in that trait, the ability to spot the law, ability to apply the law, analyze the law, critically evaluate the law, apply the technology, do a comparative analysis, exhibit qualities such as eco literacy, uh, sensitivity, uh, uh, informed citizenry, uh, which were values. And then it also had managerial attributes of collaboration, communication, leadership. So how do I design my curriculum? And simply designing the curriculum is not enough. You have to roll out. And then you have to ensure that the transformation happens. So we looked at what we call as outcome-based education. And NAP was coming out with that. Recent NAP has come out with that. So now I heard two days ago that there are softwares also available because National Board of Accreditation for Engineering looks at it. Medical Council of India came out with competency-based model recently. Whereas look at us, we don't have anything like this. Therefore, Bar Council now has to wake up to the reality and bring the outcome-based education as a norm for the entire country's <coughs> law schools. Only then we can achieve some kind of benchmark in quality of law graduates that we produce. Which means that if the law schools cannot afford, subsidize a technical <coughs> internet and MOU with the providers like Manupatra or others, get a subsidized kind of negotiation done and feed the mass law schools to see that our law graduates become at least 60% of what our best law graduates are in terms of their graduate activities. So I gave you the best practices that outcome-based education, which is not only arriving at those skills, knowledge, values, but also the process. It's more about the process. What is the process that I follow? Where faculty has the ownership, administrative staff, and the lifeline of information technology play a key role. So this is about the best practice. So in the process, although our uh, new education policy has not been strict about legal education and professional education being brought in it, probably councils got an exemption, the best part of the uh, 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 new education policy, such as interdisciplinary learning, transdisciplinary learning, we already had it because we thought a lawyer is not operating in the inert. Therefore, we had a concept of floating credits, which means that a student can take at least <coughs> two courses, either from liberal arts, something like creative writing, free writing, uh, because which is very important for research and then a few from the management uh, faculty or from the technology faculty things like data security so this enrichment within the university in transdisciplinary context is something that also is a best practice aside from that uh, three criteria one is internationalization where you benchmark your system to the best in the world whereby you facilitate uh, there are some 10 attributes of internationalization, faculty exchange, student exchange, curriculum internationalization, collaborative online learning, if that student is not able to go out, can't afford the money to travel, then you do internationalization at home, you do that for faculty also, then transnational classrooms, we had students from four university coming together and doing a project on good faith as a concept in contract from four different jurisdictions. So such widening of the stretching of the mind, the liberal attribute of the legal education. So this is also a best practice that we tried. Aside from that, uh, thanks to again late Dr. Madhavan's mentorship, we had certain courses in ethics in addition to the routinely taught professional ethics course in a Bar Council recommendation. We added ethics course on understanding fund foundations of ethics. Then uh, we went ahead with economics and ethics among other things. 
we had very well structured 18 skills courses which came in four areas based on the Boston metric of skills, lawyering skills from Australia and India's general national skill metrics. So between that we uh, made a kind of mix match and we created skills courses. So all that resulted in enhanced rate of jobs, uh, civil service uh, success, uh, in a master's level we had many passing the net examination, many passing the judicial examination, etc. So the outcome was very clear. Therefore, in the overall, I would like to say that the best practice should be based on the contemporary standards, uh, benchmarking with the best, looking at what works among the stakeholders, especially how your output in the form of a graduate fits into the real world needs and are capable of solving a problem, spotting the law, resolving a dispute, preventing the risk to the society and being responsive to the national and community needs and becoming globally competent. That was the vision we derived. According to the capacity of the law school, you can look at it. Uh, concludingly, I would like to say that uh, we have to do this within the compliance with the University Grants Commission. Financial capability that we may get according to the paying capacity and the grants, etc. that you have. But the most important one that is becoming more and more pronounced in university like ours is research. So, how do you enhance research in a law school? Because we are used to court centric research, case law centric research. That doesn't find any resonance in Scopus and uh, Web of Science publications. So, here is the national uh, new education policy related need that is coming up. That the more you produce knowledge in areas such as medicine, engineering related to justice, law, rights and policy, the more is the possibility of your law schools and universities relevance to the society and to the higher education landscape. So in enhancing research again, we went with the benchmarking and best practices. And uh, we first saw how lead researchers of India in the law faculty are working, which law school has higher research grade. And then we benchmarked certain journals, we benchmarked certain approaches, and I started my own methodological uh, handholding and mentoring to many students. So I must tell you that in terms of technology, center stage in the research, uh, the big data research, as Sir was clearly saying. We can do it in our research also, the keyword, uh, keyword search and then uh, leading to Google Scholar's keyword search and looking at contemporary research. Second thing we can do is in terms of, uh, you know, in research, um, <coughs> your PhD, LLM or other research gearing in the area of social media and uh, drawing on the social media data and creating the law, justice and uh, other paradigms within that. One of my students did on constitutionality of social media landscape and she brought many Facebook narratives and she started analyzing it from the point of view of fundamental rights. Uh, we had one research where we did the web analysis of sustainable development goals and the objectives of the companies coinciding with that and how their board reflected it, their CSR initiatives reflected it, how their business practices reflected it. So using a lot of um, high technology driven data for this purpose. The, uh, and also the point of I already told in the morning, which is about big data being used, like in Manupatra we have the judicial analytics, which judge is behaving in which manner, how many PhDs we have produced, which lawyer has a higher chance of winning the case, how many of us have down drawn on that data, it's available, you give that search word Manupatra is able to give you, other search engines can give you, but it is that we don't formulate such research problems, therefore, I suggest that now for us the time is right because if you look at global ranking, India, our aim in all of this as morning uh, from, uh, Justice Shah Sahib also said, our aim is to see that Indian education becomes the best in the world or perhaps shoulders with the best. You can't be the best in the world unless you have a proven track record in research and that research in India ideally was supposed to be done by Indian Law Institute which is again a court centric kind of approach time has come for us to look at beyond this the Archimedean space of seeing it from the interdisciplinary, highly critical approach. Therefore, we introduce one course called 21st Century Skills. In that, we uh, teach the students or uh, we train the teachers first and now it is going on. From the European funding, uh, we developed a lab and we developed the know-how and we have a virtual platform also. So, in that, how we are seeing is digital portion 
and digital uh, critical evaluation and then critical thinking and collaborative problem solving skills with or without the intervention of the technology, authentic learning tasks and reflections and assessment. So every teacher of the future needs to have that. So we started doing that and that's one of the best practice. We welcome you to learn from us. We'll be very happy to share all of that. So uh, I think that's all. I thought that I will use this to share about legal education in particular and connect it to the upcoming developments in technology and legal profession and the wide variety of need for research assessment and research excellence in our country so that it could be globally competent. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sam, for highlighting the significance of the Sam's and also research. Uh, and of course, how outcome based that the education is the key requirement and highlighting the best practices associated with that. Taking it from that, uh, I am going to share the best practices with us. <coughs> Respected uh, Justice Shah, my dear friend Dr. Shashikala, my dear friend Dr. Nidhi, and all the enthusiastic teachers. Uh, at the outset, you know, I'm just in the post lunch syndrome. So I just would like to ask Nidhi if you can reiterate the specific question that you had asked. What was the specific question? The specific question was, in fact, when I started, I said I'll take two rounds. First round is when I'm so asking you to give me the two rounds. The first. second round will come. The first round is to share your experience. The second round okay. will be on challenges and okay. submissions. Okay, fine. Uh, friends, uh, me and Sashikala, madam, you know, uh, we are into this legal education. We day in and day out, you know, we eat, drink, marry legal education. So we can go hours and days and months together when we have to speak on legal education. Uh, I uh, distinctly agree with Professor Sashikala, whatever the Professor Sashikala had said. I remember <coughs> a very famous quote from uh, Michelle Obama. And she said, there is no magic to achievement. We generally celebrate achievement. There is no magic to achievement. It's all about hard work, choices, and consistency. That's what it's all about. So whatever we do as a law teachers in the classroom, we just need three things. The hard work, choices. And choices here, I need to say that what subjects and what pedagogy, what, what methodology with which we are going to teach to the students. Now, what we all have seen, most of the times our discussions revolve around what subjects to be taught and which semester is to be taught. There is very minimal discussion in the law school spaces or the law college spaces, how are going to teach this subject? And rather than very minuscule discussion on how I'm going to assess this subject so that I can understand or I can get an idea that whether my students have learned anything or not. Generally, we have a very standardized stereotype test at the end of the examination. Very rare cases, there is some scientific outlook and approach linking my methodology with the assessment which I'm doing. So, when it comes to the law school education, what I always feel that law <coughs> operates in the society. Law is for the people. Law is by the people. Law is for the people. So how do we study law in the four world classroom? That has been the constant curiosity for me as a teacher. Because we as a lawyers and the law teachers, the entire society is our laboratory where our law is getting tested each and every time at every occasion. So how do we teach law only confined to the classrooms? And that is how I always feel that law should be immersive, the law teaching should be immersive, law teaching should be simulative, and law teaching should be reflective, rather than uh, the way in which we teach <coughs> in the classroom, chalk and talk method, and the PPT method, and generally we say sometimes the discussion method. So how do we, because when we talk about law, we are only dealing with three, three segments. We are dealing with people, 
we are dealing with property and we are dealing with the system. So this is how people, property and system and when we talk about the people, it is all about the rights of the people, the constitutional law, criminal law. When we talk about the system, it is all about the governance. Again, the constitution, uh, when we talk about the property, all the property law, intellectual property, all the regime. And the third is system, that is the governance, procedure, income tax, all these things would come into picture. So, you know what, when we design our curriculum and when we design our pedagogy, we generally tend to, we in the sense, we teachers or we ed education administrator tend to think from our perspective. We believe that we are the best or we know the best or we know what students want at the end of the day. So we never, so when we design, generally we, there is hardly any occasion to know about the students' aspirations at the end of the law college or at the end of the law degree program. What do they want to do? How do they want to learn? What are the learning style inventory? And how do I map the learning style inventory with my pedagogy? That kind of a scientific uh, design or scientific way of processing the things is uh, mostly is being overlooked, I would say. Because for me, I always believe that the pedagogy is the heart because it's the process. If we say some of the, uh, some of the, I heard from some of the uh, professors that you know, uh, when we talk about the graduating students, they say they are the product, they are the finished product. So when we consider them as a finished product, the end of the uh, program, three or five year, we need to be very mindful of what processes, what material, what design, what quality material that I am engaging with in this process. And that is something which at times uh, we, 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 we generally overlook. So, uh, and then we try to think from our aspiration, this is the pedagogy which suited best for the subject because that is what I like is pedagogy. You know, whether students, uh, from the students' perspective, what Madam said, outcome-based education is always, if you look at the John Spady, the sponge, John Spady was a sociologist who has given the theory of outcome-based education and he always said the first principles of outcome-based education is behind the back. Everything starts behind the back. What is the, what a student's aspiration to be at the end of the program, once if I want to be a litigating lawyer, I want to be a corporate lawyer or I want to be a transactional practitioner, whatever. Based upon these, what are the skill sets that we identify, for how do I map the skill sets, what is my test, what is my assessment and then I come to the content. And this is how, it's all behind clarity of the thoughts and designing back is the principle of outcome based education. But mostly, we all believe in an organic farming. So we don't, uh, we don't design so much. We, we organically teach and let students learn organically and let's see uh, because uh, I may have 60 students in my classroom, their behavioral analysis may be very different, the learning style would be very different, but I teach in the same fashion and I evaluate and assess everyone from the same, in the, with the same question paper. We never think about the customized assessment. I always tell to all my teachers, if it the human rights which I am teaching to the students, the human right is a cognitive concept, is, an, is a, con it's a concept which affects or of, which, which is all, also related to the affective domain of learning. Now human rights, you may ask, define human rights under the Protection of Human Rights Act, but you can ask, write a poetry on human rights, write a poster on human rights, a speak on human rights. Everyone has a different traits, a different uh, uh, learning style. And based upon that, can we design some customized assessment? That has been the constant uh, inquiry that we at the law school have been doing. How can we map with all students in the same way? We, we on one side we say we, we celebrate diversity and we should uh, we should follow the inclusivity principles that is the fundamental principle of democratization of the legal education approach. So at that point in time, how do we? Because this is the era of what we call, uh, this is an era 
which is uh, which is a which is an era of designer. We talk about the designer baby. We talk about the designer drugs. So everyone has an individualized path of learning. Are we being able to meet to the individual individualized path of learning or not? That is a question that we have to ask to ourselves when it comes to uh, this uh, pedagogy. The second aspect of this thing is, as uh, Professor Shashikala has rightly pointed out. When we talk about uh, pedagogy at this juncture, and that is what uh, very aptly uh, the title of this uh, conclave is very aptly kept, adapting legal pedagogy in the times of rapid change. No post, you, we need to read Richard Susskind to the great extent that how the legal education and the legal industry transforming in an enormous way. So when we are teaching in 2023 or 24, we are looking at 2030 where what would be the legal landscape in 2030 and we have to make our students relevant to 2030. Now, if you talk about 2030, you know, that what the prediction is all about, that legal, the lawyers is something, you know, I mean the litigating practice is going to change tremendously. We need a legal knowledge engineer. We need a legal no coder. Legal no coder means those people who may not be knowing the coding, but may, they know the logic, they know the system, that how the system is to be designed. So the, there are different kind of avenues which are coming up, and that, I mean different in, in, in different segment, the law professions are going to be uh, divided. And are we preparing our students for 2030? Whether our pedagogy is befitting, or are we adapting? all these emerging legal tag in our classroom. So this is the question that we have to ask for ourselves. And if we talk about the best practices, when we, I, I talk about the organization where I am for, or where the organization when I worked for 40, 15 years, we try to uh, inculcate, we try to rope in some of these ideas in our law school. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, uh, the way in which you started talking about magic and the way in which you ended with so many questions, I'm sure all of us have started thinking about it and highlighting how we need to customize and how we need to meet with and cater to the requirement of individual students because we are talking about how to appreciate diversity. Uh, and also you highlighted the significance of clinical legal education without which I think the classroom learning will not serve the purpose with which it has been initiated. Uh, with this, very quickly, I'll once again take a round and ask for very specific suggestions and recommendations that each one of you can share so that the young teachers can definitely, you know, try and inculcate that when they uh, teach in classroom and when they try to bridge the gap between classroom and courtroom or maybe the outside world. So, we'll start with you, please. And I'm sure Vidisha has just looked at me very significantly about the positive so I think it was the catalyst for that. Thank you. Make as short as I can. Uh, I will again start with the same example, uh, the law of limitation, uh, and we quickly go with directly go with the uh, subject of the detail. See, the law of limitation says that delay may be condoned in case of sufficient cause so. I will give you uh, so many examples that where a good law student will plead that I had a sufficient cause for not appearing in time and his application will be dismissed. Whereas practical lawyer will plead and prove it is a secondary thing that whether that proof is what? But the client was hospitalized, see there was some difficulty in family or some reason to show sufficient cause to prove sufficient cause. So what I want to say is that don't teach only language or words or what is written in the section or act. Teach them its real meaning. And the second example, it is a very simple example. But if somebody wants to file a complaint for murder, a statement in a complaint that X has committed murder is not sufficient. And here actually why? Courts are repeatedly having so many cases because with all due respects, many of the advocates doesn't realize the difference between 
using the word sufficient cause and proving the sufficient cause. <coughs> Similarly here, unless in an FIR you did not disclose the death of a human being, where his dead body is, and if who and how is not known to you, how it is known to anybody in the public that yes, there is an unnatural death or a murder. If you don't disclose these ingredients in a FIR for murder, it is not a good FIR, it's not a good complaint. You simply say that excess committed murder is not enough. Similarly, as I said, simply saying that I have a sufficient cause for not appearing in time or not uh, filing appeal or litigation in time is not enough. What is sufficient cause? You have to explain it, you have to plead it and you have to prove it. And this is what actually missing in law students or advocates. And that is what you need to teach them. I think I should be brief here. So I'll take it further. Uh, I already told you that uh, ability uh, in terms of knowledge is already listed out in uh, standard documents like Boston Skills document and others. So let us say you are teaching contract law. Now, uh, generally what do we teach? Principles, case laws, etc. But organizing your teaching in such a way that the time is allotted for knowledge, it is allotted for drafting, it is allotted for a real life example to be applied in terms of the legal principles and also getting a guest lecturer in the form of a retired judge or a lawyer so that they bring a live case to the class or their experiential essence. I think we all can make room for one or two lectures in our semester in that course. That's one. Then uh, arranging your lecture in such a way that your teaching, your assessment and that student's way of learning what I told you through drafting, through application, through problem based questions, uh, capacity to spot, interpret and accurately apply the law. How will you enable your student to do that? So this is quality teaching. Now as an individual teacher when you are teaching, please see that you divide your time between teaching, research and administration. So we say that 20% for administration, in our level maybe 80% for administration. Uh, young teachers who are here, we call them as gazelles in research language. Means they are like those uh, deers who run fast and we are elephants who can't run. Not that we can't be gases, but we have gained weight like elephants in the sense of administrative responsibility. So you are very sharp in picking up. So you see that your students co-research with you. You see that your students come with you for technologically enabled faster way of grasping things. You know, in our law school I did an assessment of how many of them are using these Manupatra, Lexis, Nexis, etc. They use only to gather knowledge. It's not just a tool to gather knowledge, it is also a tool to analytically, uh, critically evaluate that data. So I said you conduct a PPT uh, competition so that at least that way students see because my user profile numbers are coming low and my management is not willing to sanction money to continue the subscription if I want to top it up. Now, like now they have come out with different specializations. So always keeping a close eye on how you are enabling them technologically, not in the basic way, but in an advanced way. For example, if you are teaching evidence law, how do you bring a forensic expert, maybe Purvi Finance University or other labs are available, take them there or bring the expert to the class and make them see how the theoretical forensics are in actuality operating. Digital evidence, for example, how it is being used. Can the students be enabled by means of uh, sitting in the lab and learning it going there or being in the college, can you outsource that software? So this creativity, I tell you, all the revolution in education happened through teachers. Therefore, a teacher's role is not for working for the payment that they get at the end of the month. A teacher is a missionary. A teacher is dedicated and particularly a law teacher has to breathe not just teaching and resources but justice. And justice to that student who comes to you in terms of becoming a profound lawyer tomorrow. Therefore, you, you yourself is not expected to have all those resources. Those resources are available. Uh, 
JNLU may have better resources than one of the law schools that you may be representing. Create a collaboration with JNLU. NFSU may have better data science uh, provision. Create an MOU with NFSU. Dr. Menon used to say, go and have MOU with national institutions. Language teaching. You may not afford a French teacher or Chinese teacher. There, there may be a language institute in your vicinity or a corporate setup may be having a corporate communication department with a translator. Bring them to the class. Take your students to have tie-ups with them. So this is how the leadership of institutes can help. And uh, teachers also should not burn them with God. So I said four days of teaching or 40 to 60 percent of teaching, 30 percent of research, 20 percent or th 20 to 30 percent research, and 20 percent of administration. This is how you can divide your time, and then uh, also uh, your own progression. It's uh, institution progression. Your progression in terms of your quality responsibility in teaching and research, you will own progression to the higher level in career in terms of registering for PhD and postdoctoral, etc. So these are the ways in which one can align and these are my suggestions. So that unless you grow, unless you are rich, what do you do as a charity? Unless you grow as a person with the resource, what will you be giving to the students? So this kind of structure if you keep for yourself, this will do a lot of good. The last uh, suggestion I have is, uh, we teach a subject called contemplative lawyering, where Professor Param and others come and enrich the agenda. So we teach about consciousness, how human consciousness in terms of their innate energy uh, is, is to be used, and then how in justice and law we could leverage on that, especially in our profession, the stress, not as teachers, but as lawyers, we deal with the dark energies and conflicts in life. So how do you enable them to see it with that maturity and to keep that lifelong enthusiasm on also is our responsibility. So have these kinds of practices like counseling, therapy, yoga, gym. So I believe in a profound development of students. So they have mandatory course on basic fitness, mandatory course on contemplative lawyering, yoga, meditation, among other things. So these are just a bit of the suggestions which I've tried to cram in five minutes. But I'm sure that details will be available on our website and some of the YouTube videos which may be there in my name. So, over to the moderator. Thank you. In addition to what uh, Justice Shah and uh, Professor Gurpur said, uh, well, when it comes to the recommendations, I would like to say one thing uh, which is uh, which I strongly believe in. Uh, we never teach to our students or never get that kind of an uh, opportunity to internalize who they are. So learning to learn. Uh, I remember Madam uh, Greenwald Williams' uh, book, Learning to Learn, we used to give to the first year students in those days. Nowadays, people don't read. But then the first course is learning to learn. And uh, that helps them to develop metacognition skills. That you know, they, they may be self-aware who they are and how do they learn, what do they like, what do they don't like. So they, they should be very clear about this thing, so learning to learn. Uh, second thing is that meta-search and meta-learning, because we live in the technology era. How to search and how, how, to, be, how to identify the reliable sources uh, and how to acknowledge, because we, we live into recently the, all the, 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 the survey of those universities who were into plagiarism and all these things. So when it comes to ethics as a course, it's fine. But then how to be ethics in action? That is something which we have to make them aware. So meta search, meta learning is the other part. Third thing is in which we I strongly believe. Most of us, you know, most of our curriculum, if you see, is too heavy. I mean, in three years, in five years, some 70, 80, 90 course that we teach, which is so difficult. And that's what uh, our Indian, probably the cultural mindset, too much and too many would always be better. Uh, so, you know, we always have a touch and go kind of thing. We believe in the horizontal approach and not the vertical deep down approach. So, we will have so many courses, so it loses the charm. We never, so we never learn anything so profoundly. <coughs> the other thing is that in each course we have so many units, so much of content, I mean, uh, we want to teach everything up under the sky. That has been the approach. I believe that uh, you know that the syllabus should be minimal. Teach them only few things. The rest of the things make them hungry and make them foolish. 
don't satisfy them, make them confuse, make them hungry, let there be the, some opportunity to relearn at their own. And we need not to teach everything. We cannot make anyone master of any subjects. So give minimal, whatever you give, give the best, and the rest of the things, let them experience at their own. That's what I believe. And the next thing which I feel that we generally, we do not, we haven't hardly seen, is a reflective practice model. If we don't reflect, you know, it's very important for all of us to introspect and reflect as an individual in the personal and professional life. So, and as a lawyer, it's very important for them to be the reflective professional. So some of the reflective professional pedagogy is already available. There are so many uh, writers and books are available. One more thing I just would like to say because this whole session was on best practice model. I just shared a book on best practice for law education, the entire book written by Clinical Legal Education Association to Dr. Kalpesh Gupta and probably Dr. Kalpesh Gupta will share with everyone. Uh, last but not the least, we need to remember that we are dealing with 2020 lawyers. So how, they, how are we making them techno-proficient lawyers and in our approach uh, using and harnessing technological innovations and technology uh, product is something which is uh, uh, quite essential. And uh, last but not the least is that uh, all said and done, uh, what we have seen is that uh, critical thinking skill, communication skill, collaboration skills, you know, people generally teach all these things as a kind of a skill, separate subject. I have a great reservation for that. You can't teach communication in a separate subject. Communication is to be interwoven in every, in every subject. In written form, you give a feedback. In oral presentation, you give a feedback. This is how the Same as the critical thinking skill. Critical thinking skills, how the students are being able to develop and how to the process is to be reflected as a part of a pedagogy. So all the soft skills and the, uh, the, uh, the professional skills should interwoven with the part of your pedagogy. That is what uh, I, I strongly believe in. And uh, last but not the least is that uh, uh, everything comes from heart. So unless until we are committed, we can't do anything. So stay committed uh, and there is no alternative to hard work to be the best teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. I think we started the session when I shared uh, a thought on teaching in this era, which is uh, gone are the days when we used to think about what to teach because what we teach today is going to be obsolete tomorrow. So we need to move from what to teach to how to learn. And that is exactly what has been highlighted by all of the panelists. Thank you very much. Due to positive of time, I am not keeping the, the floor open for questions. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with us and highlighting the best practices. I think there is a lot that every one of us can take home, reflect, research, reform and teach. Thank you so much.